Welcome everyone to today's brief but important update regarding 1031 exchange timelines for um, some affected taxpayers in the state of California. Um, as you know, at Legacy Investment Real Estate, almost all of our clients are in or planning a 1031 exchange. And in most situations, the most stressful part of the 1031 exchange process is the timeline and the strict 45-day identification window in particular. And more often than not, my clients will ask, is there a way I can extend the 45-day deadline? What if it's on a Sunday? What if it's on a holiday? What if I get sick? And in most cases, the answer is no. Your 45-day deadline is a strict deadline that cannot be extended, except in some situations, for example, the one we find ourselves in right now. So very recently, the IRS did issue a notice that some people in the state of California may be able to extend their 1031 exchange deadlines. This is huge news. It's really important for you and your clients to understand their timeline and how this notice might affect it. So to help us understand this in the simplest terms possible, I've invited um, one of my important colleagues to talk through this IRS notice with us. So here today, we have Russell Marsan. He's a senior vice president with IPX. IPX is the largest 1031 exchange accommodator in the country. And if you've done a 1031 exchange before, you know that it's critical that you or your clients use an exchange accommodator or qualified intermediary for their exchange. You cannot do an exchange without one. So I've found that collaborating with Russell means that I get kept informed on big news such as this IRS notice. So I'd like to welcome Russell to talk us through what this notice means, who it's impacting, how it's impacting, and what you should do next. Russell, thanks so much for being here today. My pleasure, Jamie. Thank you very much. Um, yes, as Jamie said, I'm Russell Marson, Senior Vice President with Investment Property Exchange Services. Just spending a couple minutes with you today going over this really important information about uh, how clients can get an actual extension on their timelines uh, for their 1031 exchanges because of this federally declared disaster. Um, before I go into that, I do want to let you know that, you know, this is a recorded presentation, obviously, so you don't have the benefit of asking questions. So, if you or your firm would like for us to come into your office and give a presentation either just on this disaster relief um, or on anything 1031, because um, 1031 has been, you know, it changes a little bit every now and then. And certainly the Jobs Act recently did that as well. Um, so it's just always good to keep up to date on um, those changes to 1031 that impact your investor clients. Um, I do offer, um, if you're a CPA, I offer CPA accreditation. If you're an attorney, um, CLE, um, or just for commercial brokerages as well, um, we can come in and do an update for you. So uh, here is my um, contact information very quickly. I've been doing exchanges for over 27 years. And as Jamie said, we're the largest qualified intermediate in the nation. Uh, you can call me anytime you have any questions. And I am actually a resource for tax advisors as well. Um, a lot of things in the 1031 are kind of, you know, in the gray area, governed by case law, private letter rulings, et cetera. Um, so I'm a free resource to help you uh, to, to determine, um, you know, what avenues your clients can take. Uh, so with that, let's get into um, this new disaster relief notice. So the 45-day rule is the number one killer of 1031 exchanges because it's such a restrictive time period. And it is actually the number one concern or question that I get from my clients as well is that, hey, how can I get more than 45 days to identify? And the answer is you can't um, with the one exception. And that is if you are an affected taxpayer um, by some type of federally declared disaster. Um, now, historically, just so this kind of makes sense, because this area can be really, these disaster relief notices can be very confusing, and they got more confusing because of COVID recently. Um, so the first extension ever issued to 1031 exchangers was 9-11, um, because prior to 9-11, there were all kinds of reasons why people could not um, complete their exchange, and it wasn't their fault, but they didn't get an extension, didn't matter. Well, with 9-11, 
you know, lending institutions were down for five days. So you couldn't close a transaction. So therefore Congress uh, issued a 120 day extension for 1031 exchangers that were impacted, that they were involved in a 1031 exchange um, during um, when 9-11 happened. Uh, so they got 120 day extensions. They got potentially 120 day extensions on the 45 days and 120 day extension on the 180 days. So that's a significant extension. Since 9-11, the IRS has issued these same um, notices of extension for every federally declared disaster. So, but they're only for affected taxpayers. So what is an affected taxpayer? You know, most people would think common sense would be like, well, it's because my property was in the affected area. That's the least common. Um, it's really, if the taxpayer resides in the counties or states that are written in the notice. As you'll see on this notice, this California notice, this outlines all of the counties. And there's over 30 counties in California that are named in that notice. So if the taxpayer lives in one of these counties or their primary business is in one of these counties, they get the extension. So that means they can live in Alameda County in California but they're doing an exchange on a property that they're selling in Idaho. It's not, the property's not in the impacted area, but yet the taxpayer gets that 120 day extension. So that's really advantageous to an exchanger. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about, look at all of these counties here. I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of people that qualify for this extension even though they weren't directly impacted by it, they didn't lose a property to it, their house wasn't flooded out, but just because they live in the named counties, they get the extension. So for the, the longest time period, um, it was just these 120 day extensions. And whether or not you got it on both dates, your identification period, or your 180th day or both, um, was determined by where you're at in your exchange. So first of all, in order to prior to COVID, in order to be able to take advantage of this disaster relief extension, you had to be involved in an exchange, which means your relinquished properties closed prior to the federal disaster happening, right? So um, this notice is uh, January 8th for this particular. So if you were involved in exchange, which means you closed on your relinquished property before or on January 8th, uh, then you get 45, you get 120 extra days to identify. So 165 days to identify. And you have 300 days to close. Now, if you are past your 45th day deadline, so if on January 8th, you're already past your 45th day deadline, you don't get the extension on the 45 days. You only get the extension on the 180 day deadline. Um, so you do have to be in it before. There, there are exceptions to that. And like with the hurricanes that happened in Florida a couple months ago, um, we did, I had exchange clients that lost replacement properties. They were already past the 45th day, but all of their replacement properties were destroyed by that hurricane. So they got 120 day extensions on their 45 days. So there are some exceptions to that, but that's kind of how the 120 day um, rule works. Now, COVID changed the game. Um, COVID, there was also a, an extension issued for 1031 exchangers, but it was a generic one. It was um, the, the federal government, of course, had to address all kinds of issues because our economy shut down, right? So there was all kinds of tax extension issues for all types of taxpayers, not just 1031. Um, so they issued this one generic notice that covered all taxpayer issues, not just 1031. And it, it didn't name these this 120-day extension. It just gave us this specific fixed date. So that COVID notice was started in April 1st. Um, and then the, the extension date was to July 15th. So if you were in an exchange and your, uh, ex your 45th day was before July 15th, then it was extended to the later date of July 15th. Um, so you got a little bit of extension. Or if you're past your 45th day and your 180th day was, you know, before July 15th, you would have gotten an extension on your 180th day. Where this one comes into play, and it's it, it has its own advantage, is that you don't have to be 
involved in an exchange. In other words, your relinquished property doesn't have to have closed at the time of the notice date. So when the actual disaster happens, you didn't already have to be involved in the exchange. You could actually sell something afterwards and still get the benefit of the exchange deadline extension, right? So you know, let's take the COVID one. Um, if I had sold my property, the notice date was April 1st. So if you were in an exchange prior to April 1st, you got the 120 day extensions, which is the best. Um, but if you weren't, let's say you didn't close on your replacement property until April 15th, which is you know after April 1st, of course, um, you still, now you get your 45th day, that would have been April. So that puts you, um, that puts you to June 1st, right? Roughly for your 45th day. So instead of June 1st being your 45th day, July 15th is. So you get an extra month and a half, right? So, so now since COVID, the IRS, the IRS issues, um, they let you use two different sections, either section six or section 17, right? So if you're involved in an exchange already, by that date. So in this case, if your exchanger is in an exchange on or before January 8th, they get the 120 day extensions. If they just are entering into an exchange now, they get the benefit of May 15th as being their 45th day. So they will get uh, an extension of, you know, potentially a couple months. Um, so at that May 15th date, by the way, is a fixed date in time. So as we move closer, the later you get into an exchange, the less beneficial that is, right? Um, so that roughly April 1st ends up being the date where after April 1st, there's no more benefit to this. It's just, you're just in the regular time periods of 40, 45 days. Um, but if you do enter into an exchange prior to April 1st, you're gonna have a benefit of some additional time to identify. And like I said, this is the number one concern of 1031 exchangers is trying to get uh, more than 45 days to identify in your 1031 exchange. So I know this is very confusing and unfortunately nobody could ask any questions. Uh, so if you guys want any type of um, you know, presentation on this or further explanations, we can do Zoom, we can do conference calls, we can do live in-person presentations, um, whatever you like. Um, I'll ask a question, Russell. Sure. Um, are these extensions automatic? Do people have to do anything, prove anything, um, or is it just automatic? Great question, Jamie, and I'm really glad you asked that. Um, they, it is not automatic. Um, and we, the qualified intermediary, can't tell them that they qualify for it. What we do is we tell our clients, hey, this has just happened, but you need to talk to your tax advisor because your tax advisor, and we have a form that we send to our client. They need to take it to their tax advisor. Their tax advisor signs off on it saying, yes, they do qualify. And then we go into our system and then we change the deadline dates in our system, granting them more time in their exchange. Uh, if they don't have a tax advisor, they can do it themselves um, and sign off on that form. But we do prefer that they have a tax advisor do that form. Okay, great. That's that's a really important step. And um, I'll use this opportunity to state that nor Russell or I are um, tax preparers or tax advisors and aren't able to give tax guidance. Um, what we're doing here is taking the IRS notice, which is available online, and um, sharing that information with you. Because as Russell has made clear, there is a high likelihood that California residents who have an exchange that's happened recently now or shortly into the future may have the potential to um, receive an extension on their uh, very stressful identification window. So um, that's the main takeaway to reach out to myself and to Russell um, to coordinate with your CPA and qualified intermediary to determine if this notice um, impacts you and if you want to um, seek to take advantage of a possible extension for your 1031 exchange. So I know I will be keeping this in mind with anyone working with me right now. Um, Russell, I know you will be too. And for those listening on this call, I know you often have um, clients looking for 1031 exchange guidance, and we hope you find this information um, useful and um, take the next steps to integrate it into your planning with your clients. And uh, Russell and I will remain available to answer questions and help you and your clients with your 1031 exchange planning. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you very much.